Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and this is episode 489. Today, I'm speaking with Barry, aka Shaolin of Dimension. Dimension is a protocol to build application-specific roll-ups, and they are building this as a Cosmos app chain. Um, I go deep into application roll-ups on Cosmos with Barry in this episode. This episode was actually recorded on my podcast, The Interop, which is a podcast where I dive deep with founders and builders in the Cosmos and Interchain ecosystem. If you want to subscribe to that, you can find it on YouTube. Just search for The Interop, uh, and I record weekly episodes there. And we're posting it here this week on Epicenter because we thought this was an interesting topic that you guys would also appreciate. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Barry of Dimension. Hey, Barry. How's it going? Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Uh, this is, uh, we've been like trying to plan this for a long time and I'm glad we're finally getting it, getting to around to it. And like Dimension is, it's a product and a, and a, and a protocol that like I've seen a lot of, obviously, you know, you guys are everywhere on Twitter and, um, you know, sort of announcing cool partnerships and, uh, but haven't spent a lot of time like diving deep into the protocol. Um, I've done a lot of research for this. So I've got like tons of questions. And so I hope to uh, really get to the bottom of how Dimension works, how it scales, uh, how it allows developers to build scalable applications. But also I want to talk about how, you know, how the, how the narrative around scaling has changed over the last couple of years. I think you know, people don't realize just how much that whole narrative has changed and how much roll-ups and um, uh, uh, interoperability infrastructure is, is, is allowing that to go. So thanks for coming on and uh, right before we can have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I know we talked about me coming on about like two months ago and I was like, wait for Testnet, we'll, we'll schedule something. Then something fell through. Uh, we released Testnet in February. Uh, now it's at the end of March and we're releasing another stage of testnet soon. So we could talk about that as well, but there's so much to cover. So like, where do we start? Yeah. Well, I think we can start with, uh, yeah, a little bit about yourself and yeah, how do you, uh, how you came to become part of this team and how you got into crypto. Right. So my name is Barry. I'm uh, kind of like, I'm a DJ pretty much. I've been in crypto for a decade or now or so in the weeds out of the weeds in the in like the community aspect in the technical aspect in the business aspect uh i started in crypto in 2013 if i remember correctly mid 2013 in the dogecoin community uh those were good times where where it's like you're you're skating by kind of the law with the silk road back then and the bitcoins and the dogecoin where we were fundraising uh, the Jamaican bobsledding team, if anyone recalls correctly. I do, I do. That was <laughs> one of the first Epicenter episodes we uh, really <laughs> we were talking about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about how Dogecoin had funded the, the Jamaican bobsled team. Oh my God. That's right. So, yeah, it goes so back that's really what, that's what That's what brought me into crypto. Like back then when people were just tipping each other on Reddit, uh, that's what, like, the community aspect is what brought me. A lot of people in my, in my position come from the technical aspect. And I, and I studied engineering in, in university and, uh, different business, uh, courses and, and degrees. But what really keeps me here is the community. And what brought me here was the community back then. Uh, over time, I worked in different jobs, different protocols. And I came with the team. The team is uh, uh, founded in Israel with by a bunch of uh, engineers, PhDs, and uh, business people. They were working in the zk space with uh, mo- primarily on the Stark uh, Stark uh, ecosystem. And then they were like, "Hey, we're moving to the Cosmos ecosystem." And they talked to me about uh, me coming in as a leading product. And for me, product is awesome because. I could hear like what the community wants, where the tech is, and kind of put the pieces together. So for me, I think it's a, it's been a great experience. It's been a, a great learning experience because there's so much to learn. And every day the protocols are evolving for myself, for the community, for the all of the uh, protocols that are leading the charge in the modular space and the role of space. Uh, everything's changing so rapidly. All this new information and then the quick reiteration and implementation into the products 
is one of those things that it's kind of uh, rare in web, but very common in, in crypto is like this rapid pace of innovation. And people may not see it in like the token prices, but the tech is going crazy. The tech is really expanding. And as you said, uh, the roll-up architectures and the roll-up idea is really just kind of grow, gone, gone out of proportion now. And like everyone's building roll-ups. Yeah, it's crazy how the narrative has changed in, in the last couple of years because, you know, scaling has been uh, sort of a, a topic that has followed me in my crypto career. You know, I, I started about the same time as you. And, you know, obviously there was like the Bitcoin scaling debates, right? And a lot of the kind of primitive arguments uh, or the, the primitives for the arguments of scaling uh, began then. And then Ethereum started having its issues with scaling and you know there have been you know multiple conversations and sort of evolving narratives around ethereum scaling over the last like seven years and and now it seems like there there are people have more ideas about how to scale decentralized applications but it just like it still feels like there's you know tons of solutions for scaling nobody has like a clear um I mean, there, there isn't like a clear vision for scaling. There's like multiple visions for scaling. You know, how, how do you perceive this narrative change over the last couple of years? And, you know, what's been sort of the, acceler the major accelerator for you know, where we're at now in terms of scaling? So it's an interesting point because Cosmos also scales, right? You have Ethereum, which is the idea of Ethereum is like this world computer where everyone does the financial tr transactions and non-financial transactions. And there's like this decentralized world computer. Whereas Cosmos comes in a few years later after Ethereum's launch and they say, hey, we could have these sovereign interoperable communities. Not, it doesn't have to just be one chain. And I thought that was really cool. Like you have these interoperable chains versus this one computer where everyone is kind of fighting for block space. And that was the issue with Ethereum is like, you have like Arbitrum come along at like more, more recently at least, and Optimism and they're doing these, these rollups, quote unquote, where they're up processing these transactions off chain and putting the data and, and state on chain. But it's kind of different than the Cosmos idea, which was you, you can have these sovereign communities in these applications and then interact with each other more asynchly or more like cross-chain. And this is where kind of dimension comes in, is that they look at Arbitrum and Optimism scaling the idea of one blockchain, the main blockchain of Ethereum mainnet, whereas Dimension comes in and says, hey, Cosmos is an amazing idea. It's really incredible interoperability, the tech that they built out, the Tendermint, and uh, IPC from uh, Cosmos has been built out and it's been standardized and formalized. And we could expand on that by doing these rollups on top of Cosmos. So instead of scaling one chain, we're trying to scale a network of chains. So people can deploy rather than using a validator set of 50 validators or 100 validators, you can use one or two or three nodes, but you're tapping into the decentralization of the of quote unquote base layer, which is the dimension chain, which is a cosmos chain. And you're you're inheriting this like security, you're inheriting this decentralization, you're inheriting the stake that exists on or the bond the bonded capital that exists on the on the cosmos chains themselves. So the idea is pretty much it's rollups, but instead of scaling one network, we're trying to scale a network of networks. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it, I think the first time I I heard of this idea of app chains was in Cancun. Uh, Sunny was giving like a, a talk to a small group of people in a hotel in one of the rooms at this hotel and presenting his vision for app chains. And it like it it kind of clicked for me at that moment, and that's when I think I really got on board the app chain vision or app chain thesis, and and started looking at like these kind of sharding solutions that Ethereum or the Ethereum community was discussing at the time as um, not long-term viable, at least not the right kind of design choice. Uh, and what's interesting is how, you know, the, I think one of the prevailing narratives now is these kind of like sovereign roll-ups or sovereign zones or, you know, 
even app chain like things, even in the EVM world and how things have kind of come back around to that construction or, or that, um, that design uh, pattern. Um, how does Dimension borrow from that design pattern? Yeah, so Dimension in a way can be seen as like a super modularized and broken apart Ethereum. We have these execution shards which are the rollups. Then you have a settlement layer in between, which is the you know Ethereum mainnet smart contracts. Then you have these data layers, which are could be like data availability committees or something in Ethereum. For Dimension and how it integrates into Cosmos and how it scales the Cosmos is that you have these execution charts, which are the rollups. And there, for the user, it's just like interacting with the Cosmos blockchain. You have the minting, you have the banking, you have the staking or different forms of staking. And there's some uh, uh, adjustments to the Cosmos SDK that we make for the as like the RDK, the rollup development kit. And then you have the settlement layer in between, which is the Dimension Hub. And it's a Cosmos blockchain that connects all the pieces together. And then you have these DA layers. And like a primary one would be like a Celestia, which people are very familiar with now. And it's going to be the most scalable DA because they're using light client sampling and these really cool mechanisms. Uh, but in Dimension's eyes, any Cosmos chain can be a blockchain, it can be a DA layer. So all they have to do is be able to accept that data. Someone from, from a rollup just posts the data to that blockchain and the state route to the Dimension Hub. And then it kind of connects all the pieces with IBC. So in a way, you can consider it like a super uh, modularized and broken apart Ethereum, but also it's also scaling the network of blockchains of Cosmos. So as you said, the ideas kind of mesh together and you start getting these fuzzy barriers that you see like sovereign blockchains on Ethereum. You see uh, smart contracts on Cosmos. But in truth, the, the ecosystems kind of mesh together. And eventually, I think they will interoper- interoperate with each other when like there's uh, like snarked like clients and IBC uh, working like back and forth. Mm. Yeah, before we get into Dimension, there's there's one thing I want to talk about and sort of ask you about. And so when we're talking about rollups, uh, you know, we, 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 there's there's all sorts of terms that are thrown around. Like there's the sovereign rollup, there's execution rollups. I mean, we were talking earlier before the show about validiums. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I still have a hard time wrapping my head around how these things are different in terms of their sovereignty, in terms of um, the the developer experience, but also the use cases for which each of these and maybe other, you know, like Celestium and yeah, uh, yeah. How, how each of the, and then also, you know, thinking about that in the context of app chains and smart contracts, you know, how do, how do you see the differences between these different things and these different sort of configurations and how should developers reason about which to choose when building an application? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's one of the most unfortunate things about blockchain is that all of the definitions are fragmented. So you have uh, people on Ethereum saying like a rollup has to be uh, has to use the same L1 or or blockchain for posting transaction data, for posting state updates, and it all has to be contained to get like full security from that chain. Uh, that's arguable. That's understandable as well. You can also say that a rollup just processes transaction off chain and posts the on chain, and then that's also a rollup. But in essence, what what rollups versus sovereign rollups versus enshrined rollups versus validiums, it really just depends on where the ex off chain execution client posts the data and the and the state. So, for example, on Ethereum, it's considered a rollup if it uses Ethereum mainnet full economic and full de- decentralized security to uh, to post transaction data and state updates. For a sovereign rollup, there's like these new uh, these new phenomenons that are arising from like using these specialized blockchains called uh, DA layers or what's commonly known as Celestia as one of the protocols building this. And it just, it posts the data on chain and then it handles the state and settlement on, kind of on their own layer on there. But so it's, it's, you can argue either way. I think it's much easier to say like, what's an L2 and what's an L1 versus what's a rollup versus what's not a rollup. So sovereign rollups pretty much are L1s that post data to Celestia. And 
Ethereum rollups don't are L2s because they uh, the smart contract on Ethereum manages what is the proper fork or what is the 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 correct state and what is the correct chain. So for for rollups on Dimension, like that's the that this definition of like what's the correct chain is defined on the Dimension Hub. For sovereign rollups on Celestia, that definition of like what's the correct chain is defined on the rollup player and not on Celestia. For Ethereum, that that's defined on the smart contract. Uh, even though there's a lot of debate in the Ethereum world that I, I tried to not get into, but uh, because a lot of people talk about semantics, but practically for the uh, for the developer, uh, security matters a lot. But it's kind of like choosing the tool set from the Cosmos with the dimension included, or choosing the tool set from Ethereum with like the OP stack. So I think those are kind of like the divergent paths right now, which is the Cosmos SDK versus the OP stack, which is getting much more popular. Uh, but in terms of like what's sovereign, what's not, uh, that's kind of, people could argue semantics all, the whole time and what whatnot, but the most important thing is like bringing users and bringing applications and bringing developers. Yeah, I, I think that what, what I'm, you know, what, one of the things that, strikes me here is that you know we're looking for 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 years we've been talking about like how to scale blockchains how to scale like how do we scale blockchains but it almost feels like the wrong target you know we don't need to scale blockchains we need to scale decentralized censorship resistant uh, applications and um, the way we end up with applications that inherit the properties of blockchains and that they're censorship resistant, they're secure, they're immutable, right? Like all the things that sort of came from Bitcoin. The way we scale those applications is by having infrastructure that allows them to retain those properties while um, while being usable, right? And, uh, and it doesn't really matter what underlying infrastructure there is. And you might want to, you know, you might reason about, okay, which which are the trade-offs that your application is going to make uh, on the secu- on the kind of like blockchain trilemma for each of those layers, but you can sort of you know you can um, you can de- de- decouple, and that's what the modular blockchain uh, thesis is trying to do, right? You decouple each of those layers uh, such that the application retains those properties, even though there isn't like a one thing underneath it that is fully decentralized. And then and we haven't gotten into yet, like you know decentralizing other parts of the infrastructure like the RPC, like, you know, the wallet and this sort of thing. But but ultimately, I think that's like a good way to look at where things are going is like we need to keep our eye on the prize, which is the user, what the user interacts with uh, needs to retain the properties of a blockchain. The infrastructure itself, you know, we can we can break that up in a million pieces and probably will, right? If we look at how technology and like, Internet technology has evolved over the last thirty years. That's exactly what happened, and this is probably what it also it's also happening here. I think uh, decentralization is a uh, is a spectrum. So there is Bitcoin on one end, where you you can run your full node from Genesis and be sure like you're on the proper chain. Uh, then there's chains like Ethereum, where you're kind of either delegating tokens to a protocol that lives on the protocol, which lives on the Ethereum mainnet like Lido or Rocket Pool, and you're not really running your node or you're, you're running your node from snapshot, like from a particular state. And uh, that's kind of the same thing with uh, Cosmos chains where you, most people aren't running their full node to interact with the system. So uh, you got, you know, you have to choose as a, as a developer more so than a user because the user doesn't really know which chain as like a regular user. As a regular user, they don't know like which chain is yeah. decentralized, which chain isn't. Like they're not really comparing the centralization aspects of uh, our optimism or arbitrum, and you know we give it, we let that for the experts. But for the user, like they just want to make sure that they're secure, that they're not going to lose funds, that they're not going to lose funds by like some weird bridge attacks or attacks in general. Uh, but decentralization is a spectrum for both for developers to understand and core. Uh, blockchain developers as well. So dApp developers and blockchain developers. Like Bitcoin is one of the, and or probably is the most decentralized protocol just because you can run a full node from Genesis and know that you're on the right chain. Yeah. 
I, I mean, I, I'd love to talk more about, you know, this kind of uh, high level vision stuff. And this is the stuff I, I find often the most interesting. There's just one last thing I want to talk to you about before we get into, you know, dimension and, and talking about more, more technical things is you, uh, I mentioned at the top that uh, you you don't think that interchain security uh, should scale to more than five chains. So of course you're referring to uh, Cosmos interchain security. Why why don't you think that interchain security should scale to more than five chains? Uh, interchain security puts more effort on the validators. So if I'm a validator and I want to uh, secure, or Adam wants to secure, for example, f- ten chains, fifty chains, then in its current version, I'm not saying the future versions because the future versions kind of uh, partition the the work that each validator needs to do. But in this current version, I don't think it should scale more than like five chains just because you start centralizing the applications and you want to make sure you're not hurting the actual, the atoms value as you're getting more and more chains. So you don't want to start deploying a bunch of chains, kind of, kind of uh, shit coins that devalue the atoms um, efforts because each validator is taking their that same atom and that same amount of capital for each individual chain. So as you grow the amount of chains, the likelihood for those chains to compensate for that effort is uh, probably negligible or there's like a negative expected value as you increase the amount of chains. But there are chains that I think should be secure from day one like a USDC, uh, a, a generic asset asset issuance chain, a liquid staking derivative chain, things that really flow in the interchain. So you don't want to, you don't want those to be economically attacked. But there's chains that like there's no reason for them to be secured by fifty, uh, not fifty. They wish uh, three billion dollars in market cap. Uh, but you know that's yeah. kind of my opinion. I think it makes sense, especially for validators. After speaking with a lot of validators. Like they don't want to secure every chain or they don't want to run the binaries of every chain just because that team decided to participate. You know, they want the things that are both econ- economically beneficial for themselves and by product, the atom token as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think you're like, I think that uh, obviously things like Noble um some uh, like a liquid staking solution you know things that are kind of core to the, the cosmos hub and more broadly the cosmos ecosystem and i think it makes sense also those are the things i think that for validators can make money but you know um i don't i don't see a point for like having a chihuahua chain or something similar to that or or you know some like kind of user i, I think i think that interchain security should be reserved for infrastructure or DeFi primitives, you know, primarily, you know. For like, Adam, yeah. right? Because I think other chains are considering using yeah. interchain security as their own chain as well. So like if Chihuahua chain wanted to uh, secure other Chihuahuas or, or other Yorkie chains, then that makes sense. Uh, but for Adam, because Adam's like a special chain, it's the first chain in the cosmos. So I think it should secure as like as core of interchain protocols as there are. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's let's talk about dimension. We, we've gone on long enough here. Uh, yeah, so can you describe the the different components of of dimension and you know looking at each layer? So you know we have like roll apps. There's the dimension chain. You talked about this a little bit earlier, but Let's break each layer down and uh, how they interact with each other. Yeah. So dimension I consider, and it's kind of like a subjective uh, consideration and point of view, even though I'm a builder of the chain, one of the builders, I believe dimension is the layer two of the cosmos. And it's the layer two of modular blockchains. And the layer one of cosmos are the monolithic app chains. Now dimension hub is a cosmos blockchain that is, similar to other Cosmos blockchains like Osmosis, Juno, and others. Uh, they're different imp- implementation, but it at its core is a Tendermint Cosmos SDK chain or Comet FBT, BFT, sorry. Uh, it's connected via IBC to other uh, Cosmos chains. And then what happens is on this dimension layer two are these modular blockchains. 
the modular blockchains and why why are they modular blockchains and not monolithic blockchains is because they handle execution or transaction processing off chain so you get very low latency and then they post the data on chain and the state routes on chain so someone could easily verify hey like this data doesn't match the state route i downloaded it so like what's going on so they could submit uh what is called a fault proof or fraud, fraud proof or validity proof whatever you want to call it so that's the point of dimension is that dimension the all the rollups are modular blockchains. So it's an ecosystem of layer two blockchains in the in the kind of IBC world. Uh the those rollups, for example, they're not using the Cosmos SDK and Tendermint of what a Cosmos blockchain actually does or uses. They use what is called the rollup development kit or the RDK for short. And it replaces or changes a few of the modules of the Cosmos SDK uh, for not having validators instead of they have a sequencer. So it's kind of like this block producer that posts uh, the data off chain. And then they use Diamond, which is a fork of Tendermint, uh, not Tendermint, Optimint, which was initially a year ago forked from that protocol. That protocol, Optimint, is built by the Celestia team. Uh, for building sovereign rollups, but instead of that, we decided to remove that aspect of sovereignty on the on the rollup layer, and it posts the data to a DA layer like Celestia, and it posts the state to Dimension. So it enshrines Dimension as a settlement layer. Now, what does this provide? Why not use a sovereign rollup instead of a, a rollup? Is because uh, the the speed you get. Uh, significant uh, speed increases when you use an enshrined settlement layer versus a sovereign rollup. So sovereign rollups, they gossip the blocks to each other per blo- uh, per block. So like there's a sequencer, it posts to a DA layer, and then all the nodes in the network communicate with one another, and like they see if like the updated state is the correct one. So it's like one block, one block. One block. You can imagine it's much slower than what rollups do. And what rollups do is that there's a sequencer that batches all these mini blocks together. So you get very low latency of like, right now we're running on a testnet of 0.2 second uh, uh, soft finality on the, the rollup. And it posts the batch of blocks to the DA layer and it posts the state routes to the settlement layer. And the settlement layer has a period of X amount of blocks to say, hey, someone can submit a fraud proof or or a dispute and say, hey, like this block producer X blocks ago said it was the state was supposed to be Y, but it's really X. So the dimension hub is the arbitrator between the ecosystem. This is like the d- difference between sovereign rollups and what are rollups, which is kind of like an enshrinement of the settlement layer. Okay, uh, so I've got a couple questions here about basically like why you're building this so um what i was re- so i read through the white paper and it sounds like this uh, roll up development kit this rdk uh is a uh, a fork of the cosmos sdk or which has uh new modules that enable uh roll ups to be deployed i guess you know in in, in terms of efficiency and um you know leveraging existing infrastructure what makes it and maybe i'm missing something here You're like maybe this is a stupid question but why why not just build those modules into the cosmos sdk and allow basically any existing cosmos sdk chain to support roll apps so that you could have like roll apps on the cosmos chain and you know benefit from its security or roll apps on 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 osmosis and benefit from its security. Why why build an entirely new infrastructure to do this when we already have things that are highly secured that can provide data availability and settlement? Uh, just you know, building those modules into those chains, or is there some is is that possible, or or like am I totally missing something here? I think it's possible, but what Dimension provides is the ability to arbitrate and to prove a different environment that it's the correct environment. So for example, if you have a uh, a rollup onto Injective, if I'm not mistaken, 
and it's a Solana rollup, and an injective is a uh, wasm, then the injective has to be able to understand the uh, what's going on, the state machine logic and everything, what's going on in the rollup. So what we say, like, yeah. cha- chains don't need to go crazy and start beefing up their their the minimalistic app chains and become settlement layers and DA layers because it's quite a complicated process for actually uh, understanding different execution environments to actually to uh, handle the proofs to to verify the proofs of either zk proofs or validity or fraud proofs. So what Dimension does is, is two things. One, it says the Cosmos chains they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is be able to accept data. And then the rollup can post the data to that Cosmos blockchain. So the demand for the token and the demand for the block space of the Cosmos blockchain increases. So it inherits a part of the security from the DA layer. And that's because all the transaction data doesn't go to dimension. It goes to the DA layer. And that's either osmosis for osmosis rollups, Evmos uh, for Evmo EVM rollups, uh, Celestia for generalized rollups uh, that don't want to like pick a specific app chain because that's kind of like the core is dimension. People say it's rollups. It's really more similar to validiums in the sense that the rollup sequencer decides, Hey, which chain do I post the data? Which block space is going to, which block space am, am I going to pay for? So the, the, for, for the app chains that already exist, they don't have to change much. They don't have to change anything for a lot of them, but for why is dimension built in the middle is because it handles those uh, different virtual environments, those different execution environments. So it handles the proofs, the ZK proofs, the optimistic fraud proofs, and that's the purpose. And it, then it becomes a bridging hub between all of it. But the rollups themselves, they still inherit a lot of the security from wh- whichever pers- uh, respective DA layer that they choose. Okay, I think I think that makes sense. So just to recap here, at the top, we're going to have rollups, and we'll, we'll get into the different types. But here, you can you can you know currently there's there's an EVM uh, uh, environment, there's a Cosmosm environment, so people can deploy contracts there. They can deploy apps as EVM or, or Cosmosm. The Dimension chain, which is a Cosmos SDK chain that has a validator set, what it does is it is able to understand proofs from each of those environments and potentially other environments in the future you want to build like solana vm or you want to build i don't know like whatever you, you know build any any DA, yeah. any vm on top of that it's agnostic and then yeah. it's agnostic and then data availability the that that will post so that's basically the settlement layer and then it'll post to data to data availability chains so like celestia could be one of that's generalized data availability but it could also post to the Cosmos Hub, to Evmos, to any, to, to, it doesn't need any specific permission from Osmosis to like post data to Osmosis. Anybody that that chain can post data there. The, the so chain. For, uh, for each app chain, they will need to either include a module or a smart contract that accepts the data uh, because their okay. app chains at the core. It's like Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin a DA layer now? Because they accept like in the script or whatever it is. Uh, return, yeah. The abil- yeah, they, they have the ability to post arbitrary bytes of data. And that's the same thing for any chain. So any chain could be a D layer. And what happens is Dimension Hub bridges all the all the rollups to the the IBC world. And, and uh, why, why, I mean, why couldn't like Cosmos Hub or, or Osmosis or any other chain just integrate whatever module, like whatever logic that Dimension Hub has to understand you know these like to understand the proofs from uh from from higher layer rollups what what yeah, is preventing what I mean. say osmosis and when I mean, we like would there is there an, would there not be an incentive for osmosis to also or, or or the cosmos hub to also integrate that uh logic in order to support uh, an ecosystem of of rollups we just haven't fin- uh finished building so <laughs> 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 they have to wait, but uh, the truth is, it's an open source ecosystem, and at the end of the day, as I know very well, that a lot of it is community. So if the Cosmos yeah. Hub decides to take a module, and if Osmosis to ta- takes a module, and we take a, a module from Osmosis, it's an open source community. The tech is a small part of it. Uh, it's not a small part, you know. It is the core part. It's the foundational part. 
but anyone could take open source code. We have very open licenses. We open source everything we've been building in open from day one, pretty much. Uh, we, we don't close source anything. People could take our modules. At the end of the day, you can't take, uh, intellectual abilities and like focus our focus, the team's focus on this particular core mission from day one. We've been really focused on. So we understand the ins and outs and things that people don't talk about in the public. We understand and things that people do talk about in the public. So at the end of the day, you know, you can take modules. That's pretty easy. It's almost as easy as copy and paste, but there's much more core things to building a blockchain protocol than taking a module. Yeah. And, and, and um, what, what is the, I mean, d- d- does the dimension chain have any particular interest in posting data to the hub or Celestia or Osmosis, or is that a function of the application at, and what it's doing and what it's interacting with, or, or are all those data availability they are sort of at an you know an equal um, level or like offering similar security? So dimension chain is a tendermint chain. It doesn't post data anywhere. It's like it's a, their own validators, but the rollups do post to different chains, right? So there's the dimension <clears throat> okay. hub, which is a tendermint chain, and it's like osmosis. You know, you don't. It's not a rollup of anything. Dimension Hub is not a rollup. Dimension Hub is a chain. Uh, it has the, this is why it's IBC connected from day one. This is why people could go to the testnet and interact with a rollup and also interact with IBC because all of the IBC goes through the Dimension Hub, which is Tendermint or Comet BFT soon. Uh, okay. That's like a, core aspect that a lot of people don't get. People think of like dimensions that roll up on Celestia or people, it's a, whatever. It's not, it's a settlement layer. It's a settlement chain. Uh, the, the DA agnostic part is where the rollups can post to whichever IBC connected the, uh, chain that is connected to dimension. I hope that's a okay. little and bit so clear, a roll up, a roll up, I mean, in, in choosing in like, say you've got a roll up, why, why, like, what goes into choosing which chain they would post uh, their proofs to? So, where they would post their data to, right? Because they're posting the their proofs data, to them. Yeah. So, they're posting the data. First, it has to be approved by Dimension Hub governance. That Dimension has to, they have to say, Hell, oh, like this DA is secure enough. Like, we believe that it's decentralized. It's like a, it's a community thing. So, the first one that will be, of course, used is Celestia. Celestia has been proven to really be experts in this field. They've been proven to show how they could scale the the DA part, and they're very it's very easily verifiable where the data is, especially when you're talking about uh, autonomous uh, cross chain communication. So, like that's a core protocol that's going to be a part of Dimension. But we could also say, hey, like eventually Evmos wants to have some DA as well to fill up their block space. So then Dimension Hub could approve Evmos, and now rollups have two options. They could post data to Evmos, or they could post data to Celestia. Now, which one are they going to choose? One of the core decision uh, processes is which one is cheaper. Uh, that's because the sequencers that run the rollups actually pay okay. for transaction bytes. And which yeah, one's going to be cheaper is like it's a market, or it eventually will be a market. And that's probably like which one's the most scalable. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so it comes down to then, yeah, the availability of block space and, uh, and, uh, and the, the cost of, of storing that data and, uh, and posting that data to, to chains. Uh, the, in terms of interoperability, so you mentioned that the dimension chain is IBC compatible. Do the chains, do the roll apps themselves interact directly with other IBC apps? contracts, et cetera, or does it have to go through Dimension? How does interoperability work broadly? So I, Dimension Hub has a Diamond-like client, which is the like client of the rollup. And the rollup uh, sends that message, the sequencer sends a message to the Dimension Hub via IBC. And the Dimension Hub looks internally and says, hey, did this dispute period end? Is there a fraudulent state? And by looking internally, they could then allow uh, uh, people to bridge out. So 
IBC goes through the dimension hub because the dimension hub looks at the internal state and says, okay, like this rollup is good to go. This rollup, something happens, so we're not going to allow bridging. You know, it depends on what the internal state is. And then by being IBC connected and you can use like packet middleware, you can get these one hop IBC transactions or one IBC transaction from a EVM yeah. chain or, or a Cosmos chain to a rollup. Interesting. Um, but in your white paper, there is this IRC, this this interchain roll-up communication. How How is that different from IBC? So IRC is pretty much not different than IBC. There is no difference between IBC. It uses the IBC protocol. It just adds a client type to the I, I, IBC protocol. Um, IRC was formulated a year ago, but now that we've kind of ossified or beginning to ossify what is the IBC protocol for rollups, then it's just we've made some adjustments where we could... One of the core aspects in our decision and design process is to be as compatible with the community as it as it is. So being as compatible with the Cosmos SDK, being as compatible with IBC, those are two critical things that we want to keep. And we were able to keep IBC as it is. So eventually you could use interchain accounts, inter- interchain queries, all the applications that are built on top of IBC will be able to be used in rollups as well. Okay, that's very cool. Um, so talk about the, what, what are the, 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 what's the role of sequencers? Where do they sit in all of this? And how are they incentivized to act honestly? So sequencers uh, post capital to the Dimension Hub, and this could be in the form of Dime token, which is the Dimension Protocol token, uh, superfluid staking uh, from Osmosis, which uses the LP of Dime and the uh, the rollup token or the rollup token itself when approved by governance. So the sequencer uh, publish it, uh, post capital on the Dimension Hub, and then they get this block production time. They get allocated X amount of blocks. So if there's a marketplace or if there's a permissionless sequencing, then whoever posts more capital, then they get more block production time, similar to like a delegated proof of stake. They, those guys, they get a portion of the revenue from operating this um, uh, rollup. So they post the data, they pay for publishing the data. They post the state, they, they pay a little bit for uh, updating the state. But then they get all the revenue and it could be in terms of minting, it could be in terms of transaction fees, it could be in terms of MEV. However, the protocol decides to capture this, a lot of the rewards can go to the sequencer to pay for the operating cost. Uh, so it's kind of like similar to a block producer on a, on, a, um, on a blockchain, on a regular blockchain, but instead of everyone downloading their own data, the sequencer is uh, trusted for that per- period, and then they post the data on chain, and then someone else could come and download that data and say, "Hey, that was incorrect," and I could prove it to the Dimension Hub. And by this, you have this one of n trust assumption instead of like a two thirds trust assumption. And so, like, if the sequencer is doing something invalid, if it, if they post like a invalid state transition, then someone we just need one actor to prove that they're actually posting something that doesn't make sense. Okay, so it's it's an optimism it's an optimistic roll up con, uh, con design to to an extent. We use zk for parts of the protocol, but because zk has inherent latencies and just the tech isn't there to fully integrate into uh, uh, showing the correctness of state updates then we are focused on doing optimistic rollups and integrating ZK in less stateful things. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So one of the aspects is, so there's two aspects. One is a sequencer withholding attacks, which it's a bit in the weeds where like this, even though the DA. It's getting the weeds. Good. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 so a DA sampling and uh, what people are are aware of is that how do you avoid data withholding attacks by block producers on the on like the data availability chain or the L1 chains? 
for L1 chain for regular like Ethereum, all of the validators download the data and they check the end result. For DA chains, the the light clients sample the block producer because the, what happens on like Celestia, for example, is the the consensus network is very light that a sequencer or so on posts the data, but there's only like a commit to the data on the consensus network and all the data it goes to the DA network. And the DNA, DA network, a lot of sampling goes on to probabilistically determine like the sequencer, uh, the, the block producer on the, on the consensus network of Celestia isn't hiding any data or like that commit and contains all of the data, but that doesn't prevent a sequencer from acting maliciously. So a sequencer is not the, is on a, is operating on a different layer than the Celestia network. So the sequencer could gossip blocks to their peers, which it may not be the same block to their, to the DA layer or vice versa, whatever it is. So we have to make sure that the sequencers that are operating on dimension that when they post data to a chain that they have to prove to the dimension chain that all of the data that was posted was actually posted by them. So we could kind of ZK proofs, uh, uh, ZK proof that they were actually posting the data. Uh, we There's another way to, uh, if you have a fraud proof, instead of rerunning the whole state machine, like someone comes and the dimension hub, instead of actually uh, virtualizing the machine and then rerunning the whole state against the, the logic and the context, you can do a ZK proof of the fraud proof, which kind of shows, hey, like this input is not the correct output of uh, what the, the sequencer did. And these are also things that we're just only researching. But uh, at the end of the day, the ZK protocol or the ZK aspects of of dimension will be there and will be integrated. There will be in aspects that don't require low uh, latency. So, for example, the rollups require low latency. One of the one of the main selling points of a rollup is to have very low uh, user experience latency, zero point two second. You could go lower. It, it, it's configurable. So that's because it's a it's a mixture of optimistic design for publishing data and also the batching the batching process of quick blocks. Uh, but when you have ZK, it's it, the latency becomes much slower or much larger, even if you increase like the prover uh, requirement or decrease the prover requirement. So for us, we integrate ZK in aspects that don't need necessarily to be low latent or very fast. Okay, so when when you when you're dealing with aspects that that uh, don't require low latency. Uh, you can leverage ZK, but in, in other aspects, you're leveraging this optimistic design that has much higher latency or much lower yeah, latency. Much, so. Yeah, right. Much lower. And at the end of the day, it's a settlement layer. So it'll be able to take in uh, ZK proofs of uh, rollups that are run by uh, by provers, sequencers that are actually running on, like executing the ZK. Uh, logic, but that's not that's not scalable, or the tech isn't there for everyone to just run a zk prover and to have this kind of system. It's much more, much more scalable in the near future and the in the midterm future as well. Is to have all these rollups to uh, have just regular nodes operating the sequencers instead of these uh, provers. So, in the ca- in the event of a dispute, what's the resolution time? That's expected, or is or is that variable depending on like the type of application? Or you mean like the dispute period? Yeah, the, yeah. That's uh, so it's configurable in the Dimension Hub right now for enshrined settlement for contracts and enshrined settlement layers. Optimus and Arbitrum are using seven days. Uh, we can use that. It's it's not a like an empirical study to show that you need seven days to actually. Uh, uh, secure and optimistic chain. It's more about the crypto economic incentives and disincentives that exist. So we, one of the things that we do is we b- we're building a protocol called EIBC, which is just like an application layer on top of IBC, where a relayer would uh, confirm a transaction prior to the dispute period. So they would help in bridging out. So for example, if I'm a user on Rollup X and I want to bridge out tokens, 
but I don't want to wait the seven days, then I just do the fast withdrawal and someone else yeah. uh, takes that transaction. Taking the risk. And, yeah, and once they take the risk, they're assumed to also be verifying the chain. So that's kind of like that fast withdrawal market maker stuff that we've integrated in a trust minimized way within IBC. Okay, that's that's cool. Um, is it can 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 Dimension also settle to Ethereum data availability, or is it is it something prohibiting that from? Is it like yeah, how does that work? Uh, so, for Ethereum mainnet to be communicating with uh, Dimension, there needs to be like clients that understand the. Uh, Ethereum mainnet, Tendermint's not the problem. Tendermint has already like clients, but because of the constraints of what is the consensus network of Ethereum, it's kind of like their issue. But once they kind of figure that out, and maybe you kind of take maybe greater economic risks or less economic security with Eigenlayer uh, with uh, people at, like different nodes, only like a selection of nodes using or giving like validity or giving a attestation, then you can, for example, potentially use protocols that are built on top of Ethereum. But to use the whole Ethereum security for DA, you would need to really have, kind of like snark the consensus of the Ethereum protocol and then put it into like client. I mean, this is the same issue that Ethereum runs into for interacting with IBC, right? I mean, it's... It's yeah, like it's the, the same thing. Consensus, yeah, yeah. Because dimension consensus uses that isn't finality, finality isn't instant, and so therefore there is a delay between uh, the moment that, say, like a roll app would post data on chain, Ethereum would take some time to catch up. So yeah, I don't think uh, I, finality is definitely one aspect. I think there's other aspects in terms of uh, the way that the consensus network of Ethereum is structured, because I know. Uh, Ethereum, uh, IBC is connected now with um, Composable, uh, and they, from my understanding, Polkadot also has kind of maybe not a probabilistic finality, but maybe they do. So uh, I don't think finality is the only, uh, or probabilistic consensus is the only problem with connecting with IBC. But I'm not in the weeds of that. Yeah, that's the dream, right? It's the dream that, that Ethereum and, and IBC just work hand in hand without any middle well, men or middleware or anything like that. Yeah. It's the dream. So we could get more liquidity off of Ethereum. I think yeah. the, the more liquidity on the IBC protocol, the better for the whole blockchain world. But right now it's just siloed on the, on the polygons, on the Ethereum's of the world, which in my opinion are worth tech pro products and worse economic products than what Cosmos allows you to build. So speaking of building, uh, I want to, I want to go back to the developer a little bit. So there is, there's the, um, there's different ways of building a roll app. So we've got the EVM, uh, roll app, the, the Cosmosm roll app, but you also have this, um, RDK, which is this roll app development kit. It is from, from what I understand, it's kind of like the Cosmos. SDK and that it has modules that allows you to build a you know custom blockchain. Is the idea here to just kind of like build Cosmos SDK chains on top of uh, on top of Dimension? And you know why why have EVM and Cosmosm specific modules when you know I. Uh, we already have Cosmwasm modules for the Cosmos SDK that could also sit within this RDK. And we also have Ethermint, which could sit within. So, because, because it feels like these are three separate products. Um, no, they're one product. Are they just different? Yeah. They're just, okay. It's just one product. Okay. Yeah. So the RDK is a Cosmos SDK fork where you integrate in Ethermint or Wasm. So it's the same stuff. Like we're, we don't rebuild anything. We changed the staking okay. module. We changed the staking module because uh, what happens is the staking module is tied with Tendermint's validator changes. Whereas the sequencer is different for, and when we replace diamond, uh, Tendermint with Diamond, we have to change some of the integrations or the coupling between the business logic of a app, of a app chain and the, on, and like the networking logic or 
So like the RDK is ABCI compatible, but we change some of the things. And one of the things that we change is say, we, we have validators in Cosmos and there's a coupling between governance and computation. So a validator also validates the network. So they make sure that all the blocks that are being proposed are uh, aligned with the state logic. So they're all on the same chain, but they also participate pretty much de facto as, as uh, governors of the chain. So people delegate tokens and they don't really, the delegators don't pay attention. We separate this into two parts on the, on, on the RDK. The, the compute is handled by the sequencers. But because the sequencers can be centralized, what, what the idea of, of the RDK and what a, the idea of dimension for, for people who are watching is that, hey, we want people to build Cosmos blockchains just with a few nodes, but with, that inherit the security of the decentralized base layers. But when you have this uh, kind of aspect of where you only have a few nodes or one node even, then you start to centralize the compute and the governance. So if it was a validator, that means that everyone's delegating to one person. And that sucks. So we say, hey, we cannot allow that. We can't allow a centralization to one party of governance and compute. We can allow a centralization of compute because you only need one person to disprove that that uh, sequencer was actually doing the correct state. But we decentralize the governance by using the NFTs. So that each rollup can distribute however many NFTs. They could have one NFT, they could have a thousand NFTs, or they could have different uh, functions of distributing and creating the NFTs. And then you delegate tokens to those NFT members. So it's similar to what people are using, like SBT tokens, uh, soul bound tokens on different Ethereum chains. But here you could actually trade uh, and you could actually start to accrue more value to the NFTs and also to the tokens. So we separate in the RDK two aspects, the governance and the compute, because we don't want, we also don't think it's like economically aligned for a sequencer to decide how much rewards he gets. So it's kind of, a, it becomes a negotiation and it becomes more of like a real world uh, corporate structure where you have the employee, which is the sequencer, could be the CEO, uh, but he is operating the ecosystem, then you have board members, which are the NF- NFT members, and then you have shareholders, which are the token holders that delegate to the NFT members. And there's also rollups, for example, don't need their own token. So you can have like just pure one, one user, one vote. So you can get like these different structures and different, hopefully uh, very novel governance structures on the, on the rollup layer because they already inherent the security of the base layer. Uh, that's the core difference between the Cosmos SDK and the RDK. You inherit the developer tooling. You inherit the Go, uh, the most of, most of the Go modules. Uh, we try to stay up to date, even though we're we're moving to version forty six right now. Um, so a lot of the tooling, a lot of the protocol is very similar and tied to the Cosmos ecosystem. At the end of the day, it is a layer two on top of a layer one, which is the Cosmos. And and you guys are just like constantly refactoring or sort of merging back uh, into the RDK, the Cosmos SDK module, so that there's always this compatibility. Whichever ones we see fit to, for rollups, so not maybe like anything that's upstreamed uh, from the staking module, for example, that we may not want to use it. But if there's something that's new, like the group module, I think the group module, which allows kind yeah. of these sub sub DAOs, and with now you include like the NFTs as governors and these sub DAOs, I think that's a great uh, integration between kind of like the main community pools and the sub DAOs. So like these things are upstream or downstream to the RDK, but there's things that are that don't necessarily need to be uh, changed. Very interesting. Um, yeah, we're, with regards to the RDK, you know, when uh, when developers are building applications here, what what kinds of what, like compared to building an app chain, um, what are the what are the key differences that developers should keep in mind, and what kinds of applications do you think are just not suited for 
roll apps. Like if you were talking to a developer and they're telling you, hey, like we're going to build this new app, we want to build it on roll app, like what kinds of applications would you uh, consider not well suited for this construction and, and sort of steer them towards building like an app chain or interchain security or something like that? Yeah. So when you're developing a roll up, you're getting very low latency and you're getting easy bootstrapping. So instead of bootstrapping 50 or 100 validators, you get one or two or three nodes that you really need to, to operate as sequencers. So you have this uh, uh, con- reduction of uh, nodes operating in the system because you're inheriting the decentralization of the base layer. Uh, so with this reduction of uh, operators, you get a very fast experience for users. So if you want to do on-chain games or whatever, or DeFi products, uh, then it's amazing. It's amazing because there's two aspects. One, you never, the users never get increasing data costs. So the costs are always maintained because you could choose one DA layer and then you could choose another DA layer. As long as you can balance your costs. And then you also have this latency. The detriment or the other side is like, why would you build an app chain over a rollup? Is because your protocol really needs that uh, uh, instant censorship resistance. So uh, and a decentralized protocol like uh, like an app chain, especially with uh, new Tendermint style or new forks of Tendermint called uh, Mulipacy or one the one from Duality. They, they kind oh, of, uh, okay. I don't know about this. Yeah. So so their pro- their idea is like uh, there's a few block pro- proposers and then like one block builder, and then each one the block builder has to have transactions from each block proposer based on stake. So there are applications that really need or uh, inherent or should inherit the the instant censorship resistance from a uh, from an app chain, but that's also it's a spectrum. Like maybe you could wait like a couple of days or a day for censorship resistance. Uh, so it depends on how sensitive that transaction is to time. I think that's kind of like the critical decision factor if your application should be built as an app chain or if it should be or should be built as a rollup. And is there a like I've been talking to a lot of people about this idea and I I'm I'm starting to see this idea um you know in a lot of places and 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 so th- this this idea that you know smart contracts, rollups, app chains are not so much in opposition to each other, but exists more on a gradient. Uh, and and so that we should see things as um, e- applications evolving or sort of graduating uh, steps up that ladder. Uh, is there an upgrade path for applications that maybe start as a roll app and at some point, you know, for reasons that you mentioned, need to upgrade or transition to building their own app chain or some f- other form of consensus, is there is 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 that something that you think will happen with applications as they grow, or uh, and, and is there a way an easy way for applications to do that? I don't think it'll happen because uh, the core aspect of a rollup is you're getting very low latency, which you just don't get the same latency of like 0. 0.01 seconds. Like there's a reason why you're a rollup, and then you also have this coupling you have to kind of change the structure to fit the validators of an app chain. So you have to reconfigure things. Is it possible? I think everything's possible in blockchain. It's very fluid, especially when you get into like the social layer of things and social consensus. But at at, like a practical level, I don't think that's going to be very common. I think it's more common for interchain security, uh, consumer chain to move to a a sovereign chain. And I think that's actually one of the great, um, uh, product market fits for for interchain security is that it can secure five chains, but it maybe eventually those chains kind of should recycle. But in terms of rollups, like if you're, if you're building a rollup, then you're probably want the like super low latency and that kind of aspect of, and flexibility of uh, rollup instead of an app chain. Cool. Well, um, what's the roadmap? And when can, I think you guys already, I mean, I was, I was in the portal a while ago and sort of fiddling around there. So there is something that's live. Uh, yeah. Can people already build on this? And uh, what are some of the early projects that are uh, building uh, using Dimension? So 
we're building the first, uh, we built the first testnet, which is going it, to, it's a staggered testnet. So in February, we released the first rollup and the dimension chain. The rollup posts the data to Celestia and the state routes to, to the dimension chain. It's connected via IBC. We're integrating next week or in two weeks the EVM rollup with, with collaboration with the EPMOS team and the Celestia team. So it posts, it, it's going to reuse the IBC token for gas of EVMOS. So EVMOS, you, people are going to take their EVMOS faucet token, IBC through the portal to the EVM chain and then interact with what we're going to deploy is a Uniswap fork. So people could trade on this testnet. So it's going to be the first EVM rollup and that's IBC connected. And the cool thing is that it uses a different token. It doesn't have its own native token. Uh, that's going to be in collaboration with EVMOS and Celestia. And and so after that, we're going to move to incentivize testnet. We may throw in a few, one or two more surprises in between uh, with other collaborations, like a gaming DAO that we're, uh, that we're very close with. And then we're going to deploy an incentivized testnet where people could deploy their own rollups. And this is going to be in the second quarter, uh, likely in the latter half, like towards the end of the second quarter. And people will be incentivized to deploy their own chains, People will be uh, incentivized to participate in the ecosystem, and then we'll move on to mainnet. Mainnet is going to go from permissioned to permissionless over time. Very cool. And uh, yeah, where can be, I think people can go to dimension.xyz, and you've got everything there, the documentation, the light paper. They can uh, learn more about uh, building a rollup on Dimension, right? Yeah, check out the Discord. We're pretty, we're definitely active. We have a very active community. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to get into our community, but we do that on purpose. We want to make sure that people really kind of have heart, and we really, 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 really value the people who are building the community because it's a decentralized chain. It's their chain that we're building. We're we're taking a centralized idea, an idea that was in someone's head, to to an actual product to a decentralized protocol that you know is going to be autonomous and we need people all around the world to operate these nodes and we need people to just uh, spread the gospel awesome well yeah it's been really really fun uh, chatting with you and learning more about dimension and um yeah looking forward to seeing uh, more more coming from this ecosystem and certainly uh, you know decentralized applications being developed as uh, roll apps Definitely, definitely. I look forward to it as well. Thank you for having me.